Over the last 15 years, the fisheries sector has played an important social and economical role in Uganda as the second largest foreign exchange earner, contributing 3% of gross domestic product and 12% of the agricultural GDP. Although Uganda has more than 350 fish species, the Nile perch, Latus nilotica, and Tilapia or Echromis niloticus remain the most important, making up 46% and 38% of the total respectively. The sector depends on natural water bodies, which account for about 18% of Uganda's total surface area. The National Fisheries Resources Research Institute, NAFIRI, is a semi-autonomous public agricultural research institute operating under National Agricultural Research Systems, NARS, of Uganda. The institute is mandated to generate knowledge and technologies to increase and sustain in fish production, conserve fishery resources, water quality, fish habitat, manage research, and promote linkages with stakeholders in the fishing industry. In 1977, as you are all aware, the former East African community collapsed following the disagreement between the government of Uganda and that of Tanzania, so it collapsed. So when it collapsed, this institution now, the branch we have here in Uganda, the headquarters, reverted to Uganda, and it was called Uganda Freshwater Fisheries Organization. Then eventually, it operated from there, that is from 1977 to around 1990-94, when NARO was formed in 1992, and it took over fisheries research as part of National Agricultural Research Organization. So Naro took, it, took, uh, took, uh, took, took us up in 1994 and we now main, joined the mainstream Naro and started conducting research under Naro. And we have maintained that up to 2005 when we now had the new act, the National Agricultural Research Act 2005. And that establishes us as a semi-autonomous research organization under Naro and it's called National Fisheries Research Institute at present. We, oh, we have the headquarters here in Jinja, which mainly handles aspects of capture fisheries. That is fisheries from the natural environment. Fisheries where you go hunting, you go and get fish from, fish from their natural system. And then we have a, a research station in Kajansi, which handles issues of fish farming, which we call aquaculture. So that one is handled in Kajansi. So we have a substation in Kajansi, and we are soon establishing further sub substations on uh, the main lakes on Lake Albert, probably that would start probably before the end of this year. Nafiri is making efforts to promote fish farming to bridge the gap in demand and supply of fish created by the rapidly growing human population, local, regional and international markets, and the declining traditional fisheries. Beginning with the health issues, people have found that fisheries, well, science has proved that fisheries are the most safe animal protein foods that we can eat because of the prevalence of the omega-3 that lowers cholesterol levels and therefore fights these heart diseases we, afford, we, have, we find here. Many people have found fish to be the most safe food. And even World Health Organization and, World, and, and the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations have recommended fish as the most staple food which should be eaten by people. And today, they have even raised the per capita consumption from initially it was 19.2 kilograms per person per year, but today FAO says each and everybody must consume at least 25 kilograms per person per year. So by raising the per capita gives opportunity for us to consume fish. Now looking at the fishes that we have, the first opportunity is that we have so many species of fish. We have over 500 species of fish, and none of them poisonous. They are all edible. We can eat any form of fish. However, there have been changes in the abundance, particularly in Lake Victoria, which is the main source. Lake Victoria is the one which supplies us the largest quantity of fish. Over 70% of the fish we consume in Uganda is from Lake Victoria, then followed by Lake Albert and Choga, and then uh, the smaller lakes on the border. We have, as a system, we have five major lakes in Uganda and then over 160 smaller 
lakes. All these have fish in them, but Lake Victoria is the majority. So the change in Lake Victoria that I refer to was brought about by introduction of Nile Patch. Lake Victoria originally had very many fish species, but in almost equal proportions. However, the largest quantity had become the small cichlids. We call them lake, uh, local enkeje. I think you know enkeje. These ones you find on, the, on sticks. People use them now for treating measles and etc. So at the colonial time, it was felt that this fish could not sustain, sustainably be eaten by people. So it was better to look for a way of putting there a fish that would transform this. So they considered Nile Patch, which was originally in Lake Albert. When we talk about introduction of Nile Patch in Lake Victoria, people misinterpret this information and think Lake Victoria, uh, Nile Patch was brought in, is a foreign fish was brought in from outside Uganda. That's not the case. It was simply transferred from Lake Albert, where it originally exists. It evolved in the Nile system, and that's why it's called Nile Patch. Then it was only transferred into Lake Victoria. So when it was transferred into Lake Victoria, it is terms of reference was to eat this small fish and convert it into what the colonialists termed the table, uh, table fish, fish of, of table size, fish which you can convert and put on the table and people consume. And Nile Patch, when it entered in the lake, it actually accepted the terms of reference and it fed on them, converted into big fish. At that time, when we started the names were crossing, it was being called Sablenia because of a lot of fat, but had very few people who were eating it. So another opportunity arose. It quickly hit the commercial market and the factories were established. We got up to, I think 22 maximum number of factories we got in Uganda, up to 22 fish processing factories, which came all targeting Nile Patch and they were processing it for export. So we're earning a lot of money out of it, but the challenge came that we now overfished the fish. Between the years 2000 and 2003, the Department of Fisheries Resources, DFR, under the Ministry of Agriculture, Animal Industry and Fisheries, MAIF, organized a number of national and local level fisheries stakeholders consultative workshops to discuss the major fisheries management issues affecting Uganda fisheries sector. The major problems identified then were fisheries resources depletion, and environmental damage and poverty among fishing communities living around Ugandan lakes such as Victoria, Albert, Choga, Edward, and George. They continue now hitting them until the large, the population of the large fish came down. Then they went for the smaller ones. We were actually in a process which you can term defiling fish if defilement can be applied there because we're also eating the younger fish. In the capture fisheries, when we started. The first and important issue we made was the issue of uh, coming up with the idea of having a size that can be harvested, which we call the slot size. People started on Nile Patch and they didn't know where the fish, the fish that would be targeted. So we did our studies of studying the size at which the fish breed, the size at which the fish has the highest potential to produce, and we came up with what is called the slot size. And the slot size was to determine the lowest size of the knife fish that should be caught and also fix the uppermost size. Actually, we are proud to say that in the whole world, we are the only first team in a region, a region which came up with the lowest size and the upper size. The lowest, people, people have used it elsewhere, but putting the upper size was only our own innovation. Because the lowest, we protect the younger fish. But the, up, the, upper, up, upper, uh, the upper, uh, upper limit, we also protect the large fish. The potential we have in, in Nile Patch, for example, for, for, for your information, Nile Patch has very high fecundity. Fecundity is a term that is used to indicate the number of eggs it can produce at a given time. Nile Patch produces 140 eggs per gram of body weight. Indicating if you have a fish which can grow to 100 kilograms, that one will produce for you up to 14 million eggs at a go. So a fish which has that type of breeding 
is important because you only need very few adults to produce this. So we fixed the upper limit to produce those few adults. Another achievement for NARO is that it has studied and mapped out the critical fish breeding areas in Lake Victoria and has requested them being protected. NARO has also successfully created and implemented an eco-friendly biological control system for lake weeds, which were a destructive force preventing many economical activities on the lake. In the area of aquaculture, we started on the area of cage culture. There are over 5,000 cages on Lake Victoria. NARO has come up with a system where we can produce large quantities of fish in a small volume of water. In low volume, high density cages, we are now producing up to 120 fish per cubic meter of water. In Kajansi, through fish breeding programs, NARO has started producing fast growing tilapia, which grows by 2.48 grams per day compared to the wild tilapia, which grows about 0.65 grams per day. Then also, in the area of fish, uh, fish feed formulation, we have come out with fish, fish feeds that uh, are cost effective. That is, you put in little money, but uh, you're able to get it because they have high, what we call high uh, food conversion ratio. When the fish feeds on it, it gets a lot of uh, energy from the, from, the, from the little food it eats and grows faster. Then also in the area of fish health, we have come up with the utilization of plant extracts. We have become herbalists. Plant extracts and generate those extracts which can fight bacteria in fish. And that has been also a good breakthrough. The human impact on the lake with the increased activities around the lake, such as sand mining, illegal cage fish farming, and environmental stress has implicated the lake and fish populations in the form of pests and diseases, general fish health, new lake weeds such as cariba weeds, and silting of the lakes due to clearing of the marginal vegetation which is meant to naturally protect the lake. But because people have become very many more, they have cleared all those. And as we clear this marginal vegetation, we now allow the silting of the lakes. A lot of water has been land has been cleared, and the, and the, and and what and the, and 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 the soils end up in, in, entering into the water, making the lakes shallower, making the river rivers where they pass shallower, and also making the water misty. And if the water mix gets murky, water gets murky is not no longer clear. Even the fish breeding is interfered with. There are some fish, fish actually breed by seeing each other. They need the male, the female, to select a male must see, and the visual acuity is reduced by the water changing color. With all this in mind, if one is interested in improving their fish farming or starting out in the fish farming business, narrow executives have some noteworthy advice. Fish is still very virgin area because there are few fish farmers but people have been doing it in a, in a, at, at very small scale. I would give advice that please take up fish farming but enter and do something which is large enough for you to break even. The moment you do very small things you will not break even. The, um, the costs of investment cost and the cost of running will be much higher than the, the, the profit margin you gain. So you will not make. So I want somebody to go in and go for a bigger, a, a bigger investment. And then the advice I would also give to go in for, uh, if, you, if you are near a very good source of, of, of water like a lake or where, you go in for cage fish farming. Because there, the production cycles are shorter and you are able to produce fish in, 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 in a very small area and large quantity of fish if you can invest in cages. Cage fish has not been in Uganda for a very long time. It was introduced in 2006 on an experimental basis in the source of the Nile cage fish farm with 50 cages. The venture was partly supported by US aid. Innovation in technologies such as cage fish farming have been embraced by farmers and is increasing the population of fish for Uganda. A farmer using cage fish technology is more productive than one applying capture fish because they will produce 12 times more tonnage per annum. Since 2005, 
There have been constraints on the supply capacity of fish export, yet the international market is lucrative. Adoption of floating cage fish technology is a viable solution to this because on average 419,249 metric tons of fish, mainly tilapia and nile perch, is produced by 116, 225 fishermen annually using the capture fishery production system. That means that on average, each fish farmer produces 4 metric tons. And on the other hand, a farmer using cage fish farming would produce 48 metric tons annually. Egypt is a leading practitioner of cage fish production in Africa, and China is leading in the entire world. China has succeeded as a result of adopting a five-year aquaculture development plan by promoting the technology among farmers, as well as increasing the number of fish species through breeding fish fingerlings. NARO is enabling a similar plan to increase fish production through cage fish farming through its initiative by the Zonal Research and Development Institutes in sensitizing farmers in breeding fish through cage culture farming. However, farmers wanting to enter this business need to consider the potential environmental challenges of cage fish farming. A suitability and capability assessment needs to be done on their potential fish farm. Since the cages are being put in the lake, which is a public property, other users and uses of the lake have to be considered so elements like oxygen levels, water depth, ETC, also have to be considered when carrying out this investigation for the report. As an added measure, each potential fish farmer is required to get an environmental and social impact assessment as required by NEMA. These two documents are necessary in order to get a license for cage fish farming. After doing a capability and suitability assessment report, the farmer is guided on how to come up with a plan on how many fish cages and the capacity of each cage can be suitable on his planned farm. Nafiri conducts trainings with farmers on how to stock the farm, feed the fish, and on monitoring diseases and environment. There are two kinds of cages being used currently, the high volume low density cage and the low volume high density cage. The low volume high density cages have a volume of 30 cubic meters and lower, while the high volume low density cages have a volume of 32 cubic meters and above. Uh, pet fish farming has changed communities in such a way that after doing the capability and suitability analysis for these investors, they tend to bring what we call uh, development in an area. We realize that some communities which didn't have roads that access such sites, those roads were constructed. Also, these investors who come around to do cage fish farming, they are helping. There is what we call a multiplier effect. Whereby, if someone starts up an enterprise like cage fish farming in an area, someone who had never gotten any idea about such tries to get to land and know what is this person doing and you realize that the whole community gets to land. In 2006, there were only 50 cages to begin with and now there are over 3,000 cages. A guideline for selection and zoning of sites for cage fish farming, as well as a manual for the successful operation of cage fish farms and aquatic sites has been developed by NARO. The guidelines and manual are applicable in facilitating establishment and operation of cage fish farms in Uganda and other East African states sharing Lake Victoria. A cage fish farming site was established near Nafiri in Jinja to act as a site for research and demonstration on cage fish farming technologies. Other sites that have been identified for cage fish farming and aquatic parks are in Busia, Mayuge, Jinja, Boikwe and Kalangala districts and they have been mapped out to provide information on the sizes of the operation areas. Now in Nissan Fish Farm we do three main things. We do the breeding of fish, that is where the activity is in the ponds. We have about 64 ponds, and out of 64 ponds, they are divided into four different activities. There is uh, fish breeding, there is uh, resting, there is uh, finger line uh, nursing, and there is sex reversal. So those are the three main, I mean, four main activities that take place in the ponds. Sun at the moment is the biggest fish farm in East and Central Africa. It is 12 years old. It was started in uh, 2006. We are the biggest fry producer and whole round fish producer. 
At the moment, the fry we produce, we only consume about 20%. I mean uh, 40 percent, the remaining portion we sell it to other farmers who also grow them and sell to the market. Now the, the fry we sell to other customers is 0.3 grams. The reason why we do that is that we are aiming at promoting aquaculture in Uganda and East Africa as a whole. Being the pioneer of this industry, we have contributed a lot towards the growth of this industry by providing the seed, which is the young fish, and also offering technical support to other farmers. Now, the merits are so many. Now, for us being the pioneers, we have realized that in order to have environmentally friendly operations, the inputs in the lake are supposed to be inputs that are well regulated in quantity and should be floating. So we have encouraged even the people who have joined us to use floating feeds in the lake. At the moment, our production capacity is about uh, 100 tons per month. Now, to produce 100 tons of fish per month, that means you must have consumed minimum of 150 tons of feed at an FCR of about 1.5. That is for a good operation like this one. The, the newcomers will always achieve higher FCR. Now, this operation is an operation where you can coexist with the environment. You can coexist with the world stock. You plan your activities, you regulate your activities, you monitor your activities, and make sure that at the end of it all, what you put in the lake is supposed to, one, not destroy the natural ecosystem. Then two, it doesn't affect the quality of water. So in order for us to ensure that actually from the start of the operation until now, we have not altered anything in the lake. We do quarterly environmental monitoring. Now in the quarterly environmental monitoring, we are basically looking at what was the quality of this water before we started the operation. For the say 12 years we have been here, what has changed? Which other new organisms have come to live in the same environment because of our operation? Either because there is a debris that is attracting it to coexist with that. Then too, what was the quality of water then and what is the quality of water now? In terms of the pH, in terms of the dissolved oxygen. Because those are the two parameters that support life in the lake. If the oxygen is getting depleted, that means even other organisms can no longer live in that same environment. So those parameters, we monitor them three times in a day. Before we start any activities in the morning, we start by testing the DOs and the pH of the water. Then at midday, we test the pH and the DO of the water. At uh, four, we test the pH and the DO of the water. That is supposed to basically help us know that actually our operation is not compromising the key parameters that are needed in the environment to support life. Uh, we cut out uh, harvest uh, on daily basis, but the volume varies from day to day. Uh, Mondays, Tuesdays, uh, Wednesdays, and uh, th Thursdays like this, we normally do our, our big volumes. So for harvest, like today, we are looking at harvesting about uh, 4.5 to 5 tons of fish. About four of them is going to Nakuru. Then the other one is going to Kampala. The small truck goes to Kampala, the medium one is going to Nakuru. Yes. Then uh, there are days when we load the trucks that are bigger than that, this one. That is when we are loading for Nairobi or Eldoret. Yeah. Now, there are many things. One, in order to pro, uh, promote food security, we need to have controlled production of white protein. Now, we all know that uh, the whole world is moving away from red meat to white protein. This white protein, for Ugandans' case, has been coming from the natural stock. And we are all aware that the natural stock has been declining for the last few years. Now, the only way how we can guarantee that even the generation that will come in the near future will find what to eat is by producing that food ourselves. And fish farming doesn't only protect the natural stock, but it also provides job I mean, uh, employment opportunity. At Sun Fish Farm, at the moment, we employ 103 staff, and the majority of whom are youth. Then we also contribute to the national coffer 
that in 2017 alone, I think our contribution to URA was close to half a billion. Now, all these are economic activities. Then, too, the fish down here seeing this is a Kenyan number plate. That means we are attracting a dollar into Ugandan economy, improving on balance of trade, because all the fish that we sell, apart from the sales in the local market, we sell them in dollars. And the dollar is the much needed currency in Uganda at the moment. So if we can get more of this through fish export, then I would actually encourage more farmers, more investors to put money into industry where you are sure that your product is most preferred in the foreign market than local market. That will help government improve on the balance of trade as we are creating employment and we are also providing uh, white protein in order to improve on mal malnutrition, which is a problem still in Uganda. Yes. The work at Nafiri is evolving every day. We have heard from the scientists and one of the beneficiaries about the challenges, solutions, and facts involved in aquaculture. Join the conversation on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube at Naro Uganda. We would like to hear from you.